Okay, here we are. Uh, my guest today is a, a very accomplished musician in all different styles. Uh, I really uh, don't know too much about him, so I'm looking forward to this opportunity to, to learning his story. Um, as of right now, before the pandemic, he was playing a lot, of, um, a lot of pit shows and some stuff on Broadway, I believe, and we'll hear all about that and the stuff leading up to it. Please welcome Dan Hardington. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Ben. Um, so like we were just saying before I press the record button, you have a very um, interesting and unique story about to, to how you came into this, this kind of position or positions that you're doing uh, with guitar. Um, when I met you, it was probably when I first started studying with Chris at Central which was the better part of a decade ago, maybe nine years ago, 10 years ago, and you came and played Villa Lobos A22. And I said, oh, the classical guitar is kind of cool, uh, especially because you, you shredded that one to, to bits. Um, <laughs> That's cool. I don't, I don't remember, remember that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've done a little bit of everything. Um, before the pandemic, what were you doing? If, if everything hadn't shut down and the whole world stopped, what would you be doing right now? Well, one of the really stable things that I've done for a very long time is I've always had at least one teaching job. Um, usually I would always have at least two, but for the past two years, I've only had one. So uh, I teach part-time at uh, Eastern Connecticut State University. So I would be doing that one day a week, teaching guitar lessons and guitar ensemble. Uh, and then other than that, I would be playing at this time, March, April, in the beginning of May, it's kind of like the peak high school musical season. So I, uh, until this stuff happened, I had every week from, I don't know, maybe late January up until the beginning of May, every single week I was doing a different, would have been doing a different show at a different high school around Connecticut or college, uh, mostly high schools. But so I would have been playing, uh, I don't know, Matilda, maybe about three or four times because it's popular right now. Uh, I would have been playing In the Heights, which would have been a lot of fun. And what else got canceled? Oh, Pippin got canceled too. So that's what I would have been doing for now uh, before the summer regional theater season started. I know next to nothing about uh, musicals, but that's not going to prevent me from dipping my toes in the big boy waters with you tonight. Um, <laughs> in the Heights, they just, I believe they just made a movie, right? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's done or if it's, I know I saw the trailer not too long ago and I, I have a friend who is slightly in, or is somewhat involved in something, some aspect of that movie. Um, yeah. Which is which is pretty cool because I've gotten to hear a little little bit about it. But yeah, there's definitely a movie coming out. I think it's I think people are pretty excited about it. Yeah, my vice principal at my school is like big into that, and I, I believe he knows some of the people that um, were were on the big production of that. Um, I don't I, mean, I don't know if there was still run, one running on Broadway, but I know that he's he's very familiar with a lot of those people. Um, and those are not those are not small gigs i mean uh, the last time i played a musical was shrek jr in wallingford and they paid me a thousand dollars for five days of work uh and it was all from like 5 30 to 7 30 and that's including tech days i mean those are those are not bad gigs yeah some of them are great like that and then some of some of them are not like that some of them yeah. you know the pay runs the gamut and it's um the good thing is that there's lots of it and being being a guitar player who can do that sort of a gig, there generally, there aren't that many around, or, you know, down in New York, there are tons of guitar players who can do those gigs, but up here, there's not that many. So there's plenty of work to go around in that. So whether they pay a thousand bucks for the week or they only pay maybe like four or 500 bucks for the week, it's still, there's enough work to add up over the, the high school season to supplement teaching or make you know a, a decent a decent living right right um but this isn't this wasn't always your gig uh at, at one time you were a full a full-time classical guitar when i say gig obviously as musicians we we draw in and we pull from all different uh, sources of revenue but um 
but as a performer, you were a classical guitarist for a long time. Um, why don't we talk about how you got there? Because uh, when I first met you, you were Dan Hardington, the heart classical guitar guy. So um, let's let's start with with uh, with classical guitar. When did that come into your life? So I started with classical guitar at uh, URI, University of Rhode Island, uh, and this was a, a ways back. I think when you saw me playing A22, that was a decade after I had actually started it. So the early 2000s, I had been at URI for a year already as a history major or undeclared or something nebulous like that. And um, I decided to switch to music and all they had was classical guitar. They didn't have a jazz program. They didn't have anything really with formal study other than classical guitar. So right. I had already kind of made the decision that I wanted to pursue music. So I just, I gave it a shot and it was a, kind of a bumpy start, but I, I stuck with it and I, it really kind of, I don't want to say clicked, but it, it grew on me. And I think it was actually maybe right around my junior year or I guess my, my third year in the music program and the, and then the summer before my senior year where I really went all in on it. Um, Who was, I, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that I had met a bunch of really good guitar players around that time. And it just, I got really excited about it. So I kind of decided to dive in. What my, one of my classmates also gave me a hard time about not being dedicated enough. So there was a little bit of, yeah. competitiveness i think it, it, that tends to happen i think especially in the the guitar world or at least the the academic guitar world i i i feel like this probably happens in jazz programs too where when you are you're confronted with this um uh i don't want to say intimidating but it's it's like a it's a, quite a sizable amount of of things to cover to to get a good education not only do you have to practice but you have to practice a certain way and you have to you have to understand the history of it and you have to look through all these different lenses but to have that community of of people either um you know lighting a fire under you or antagonizing you not in a not in a literal way but sort of getting you going or just to encourage you or, or people to, to talk shop with uh that certainly helps what was the scene like at um at in Rhode Island when you were studying there who was the uh, who was the instructor at the time so the uh, teacher when I was there is actually a Hartford guy uh, Daniel Salazar Jr. yeah um, big Hartford name big Hartford name he's a uh, he's an institution in Hartford and he uh, he was the teacher while I was there and then I think he was still the teacher there for several years after I left um, so I studied privately with him and I studied, I did a really short time, maybe three or four months with another private teacher in the area just to kind of get ready for right. a, an audition. I think I had to learn, I think I learned the Bach minuet in G and, and uh, Soar 5. The B for minus. an undergrad audition? Yeah, like okay. crash course. Basically, I, cool. I wrote in so many fingerings that I might as well have been reading tab. But um, I had to, I had to really just kind of cram to get something in my fingers because I had gone to Dan Salazar or Daniel Salazar um, in the first semester and I had bought a, the beginner Yamaha nylon string guitar for like 110 bucks or something. Did it come and with the gig bag? No, I carried it across campus like with in just like <laughs> like like this over my shoulder. Dude, you can't do that. <laughs> I literally carried it across campus over my shoulder because I didn't have a case for it or anything. It oh was, you know, it was the first week of school. So it was September. It was warm. It, was, it yeah. wasn't like a cold Rhode Island winter, but I went and I played, um, I kind of like played a little bit of dust in the wind to show him that I could do something. And then I played, I'd actually learned a big chunk of uh, one of the Paganini caprices with a pick. And so I played all that for him. And I'm, I'm, the, not, I, I'm not I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at that's the guitar thing to do, right? Who wouldn't do that? I mean, I had somebody had introduced me to Ingve. Right. Like I, I didn't know of Ingve when I get to went to college, and somebody who lived in the same floor as me in the dorm was like, "Oh man, you got to check out Ingve." And then he pointed me to Petrucci too. So 
I, I got into Ingve and I learned that Paganini thing and I played that for uh, Daniel and he was like, well, that's cool, but that's not what we do. So you need to go take, <laughs> some, you need to go take some lessons and, um, and figure some basics out and then come back next semester and then we'll see what we can do. Which is the right thing to do, right? As yeah. A, as in, in the moment, it feels like maybe like a slap in the face, but it's, it's ultimately the right thing to do when you're trying to run a program and, and uh, get people interested in your program. I was so nervous and so intimidated just to be in the music area because I, I didn't know. I, I just knew that I liked to play guitar. I didn't really know anything. I'd never studied it formally, and I just you know wanted to play. So... I was in no way offended by that. I just, I was like, okay, cool. I'll go, give me the number of who I'm supposed to call and I'll go call them and, and I'll do it right away. And I did it that, I'm sure I did it that night and I started taking le lessons for the first time ever. So yeah. it was, uh, it, I was intimidated for sure by just being around there. You'd, you'd think I was walking around Juilliard with how like scared I was just being around all these musicians and I didn't even know who anyone was. Yeah, it's definitely a, a a shock, especially I'm I'm guessing this was your first time at in college, and so it, it's almost like uh, it's like um, this magical world, right, uh, of of university life, and then you go to this place and they, it's this one specific building and a whole campus, and they take music and break it down and know so much about this art form that is largely invisible and and. Uh, Intangible. Is that a word intangible? Or is it untangible? Intangible. I'll go, with, I'll go with it. So, you know, and, and it requires all this theory and understanding and brain power. I could definitely relate to that. Um, you know, especially when I went to, cause I went to a, a state school as well. Um, so what is the, so, so we have a very similar story in terms of undergrad to grad school. We studied with, and I think I can, speak for both of us we studied with a very a pretty strong instructor at a pretty okay school right for music for music and then w followed that teacher uh it, it followed where that teacher went to school i followed the actual teacher you followed in that teacher's footsteps and kind of saw where the uh how the the sausage was made so to speak so well, I'll, I'll spell that out for people for the two viewers that are, are watching which is my mom and my dad and um, you're, you're going to have to add my mom and my dad in too. Oh, nice. Hi. You'll catch this one. Mr. and Mrs. Hardington. Um, so Dan Salazar, uh, studied, Daniel Salazar Jr., studied at the Hart School with Dick Provost, right? I, I believe yep. it, was, it was, was it just Dick at the time? I think there was, there was another guitar teacher. Alan was there. Alan Spreesersbach was there at the time. And I know that Daniel studied with Dick, but I know that he was also there um, – maybe for his master's or, or an AD, I'm not sure, but I know he was there okay. at the time that Oscar was teaching there, that Oscar was in residence. residence. So right. he was studying with Oscar a bit too. So, so Daniel Salazar studied with, let's just say Dick Provost for most of the time, who studied with many people, Oscar Gilia, one of them, and yep. Oscar Gilia goes up to Segovia. So the people at the, the Hart School have a direct lineage, as, me, as a lot of people do, because the, the classical world is pretty small. And uh, in, in no way do I say this as like a, a you know, a chest puffing maneuver. But we study with one of the direct lineages from one of the arguably greatest uh, contributors and players to the to classical guitar. So I followed Chris Ladd, actually went and because he left central when i was done studying there and sent and chris ladd studied with the same instructor that daniel salazar studied with with which is uh, dick provost so uh my question for you is what was that experience like going from uh, um, a state school with a great teacher crash course sort of i'm guessing sort of supported by the building that you were in to going and getting like that times a million at the heart school yeah it was it was great i loved it i loved every second of being at heart except for maybe some of the academic stuff that i had to do just because I, I i had been in college for so long that i was just kind of done with academics i wanted to focus on playing but you know at uri when i started there i was like bottom 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 of everything ear training theory 
my playing. There was nothing that I was like, I couldn't hang with any of the students. But by the end, I had gotten serious enough. I was one of only a couple, maybe three or four performance majors. Most of the students there were music ed. Um, so by the end of my time at URI, I had sort of, at least with classical guitar, sort of risen through the ranks a bit where, uh, you know, I had felt like I established myself as a, as a good, you know, as a peer amongst all the other good players. And then I got to heart and it was like sophomores playing circles around me. And there were some, there were some really good players there when I was there. This is, so I was at heart at, for 2005 through 2007. And there were a bunch of really good players who had just come through that I barely just missed. But then there were some really strong younger players that were starting when I was there. So, um, it, can it you was, name can you name drop a little bit for us for the people who were there? Anybody? The, well, some of the people that I missed who I had met through the festival, but I missed there was a, a guitarist named Alex Walker who I believe is still very active, but in LA or on the West Coast, and he does a lot of commercial music. There was a guitar player named Luke Honer who I think is in the Philadelphia area, maybe. And I've heard I that heard, name from Chris. I got to hear Luke play a handful of times uh, before I got to heart. And they were both, Alex and Luke were super friendly, really nice guys and amazing players. So uh, those were the people who had just, I had met, but they had already gone through before I got there. Um, and the people that were there when I got there were people like uh, this guy, Phil Wright was there, um, a young player named Jared Elder, who really sounded great, a guy named Adam Rose, who sounded great, Nick Catronio was there, who sounded great, um, and a guy named Derek Monahan, who was a graduate student with me. Oh, sure, uh, I know him. My, uh, I, think, I think my dad plays in a band with him. <laughs> yeah, Derek's a really, really great musician, and I think he would argue this, but I say... He's a very creative musician. I think he would probably mm. argue against me there, but I think he's a very creative, good musician. Uh, and he was a good person for me to work with directly. So there were, there were a, lot of, a lot of good players there that I really felt if I didn't work hard, there was no chance of me hanging with them. Right. Well, what was one of those early things that that jumped out at you as something where you were like i need to fix this now or um or like an adjustment that you realized that you had to make well i think my my memory of the timing is probably a little hazy but the i know there i just actually shared this story with derek recently about how him and i were rehearsing a duo together and he said, hey, why, can you just count your opening measures while you play them so I can hear what you're doing? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, just, just count the rhythms as you play. And I was like, I can't do that. <laughs> and he's like, oh, well, our coaching is in two days. And if you don't learn how to do that, Dick is going to kill you. And Truer it, it, words have <laughs> never been spoken. <laughs> he may have been a little less, he may have been more blunt than that. Right, but sure, it, sure, sure. But it was it was really eye opening to think of, you know, how important it seemed to him and how oblivious I was to that even being a thing. There's something really magical about um, the basics being able to take you so far in classical guitar. I'm sure this is true for other instruments, but I don't want to speak for them, but the, you know, Chris, Sad Chris Ladd says all the time, you, you don't have to go back to basics if you never leave them. And that's, that really does help you. I mean, there's, there's times when you need to do um, things and think outside the box and be really creative. But a lot of the time it's that list in Dick's book, right? The, the list, which yeah. is of course the, the list of things you need to know in order to play a piece and play it well, uh, play it informed, I think is the word. I have know. rewritten that list for students hundreds of times. Maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but I've written that list down so many times that I'll ne I, I think I can even do it in the exact order that Dick wrote it in one of those books. And even if, even if somebody listening or, or some, you know, another musician doesn't agree with that list, the, the truth is whatever your own list is, if you 
if you don't know all of the basics, then how can you do something that is above the basics? And so I would agree with you that that was something that was um, really difficult for me when I got to heart. I had gotten some of those in my undergrad, but I think the amount, like the, uh, the amount of like instances per week that I would get those reminders at central at the state school where it was only really one or two really good instructors um, was so much less than Monday lesson with Chris, Tuesday coaching with Chris, uh, quartet rehearsal in the morning, and then just studio class, evening with guitar, getting those reinforcements over and over and over again um, really took me. And even now, two years out of my master's, I'll still think, oh, you know what? I know I missed that. That's one of the basics. And I, I wasn't as thorough with that as I, as I should have been. What yeah, I think actually you just hit on one of the things that makes, and I, I talked to my students about this too. One of the biggest differences between um, where I teach now or where I went and a conservatory is just the, the sheer amount of time you spend learning and talking and being around guitar for my students they see me for an hour lesson and they see me for an hour of guitar ensemble so they get me for two hours a week and as they're approaching their senior recital they get me for a little bit longer but they, they play senior recitals at at eastern yes eastern wow yeah. is it a full hour uh it, it it's a little flexible it's less than a full hour solo recital but it's there is a solo classical guitar component but it's not a full hour necessarily that's awesome i mean i my performance requirement to to no uh no knock at chris was uh it was the the decision of the music department was i think to perform once a semester one piece at one showcase and that was flexible you could get out of it if you wanted to um and I was a music ed major and I, you know, and while you could argue, yeah, it's not as important to, to have that, that part of it down, you know, having a slightly higher bar for performance wouldn't have killed anybody. And it probably would have given us not just the, the guitar students, but the other students there, you know, uh, a taste of what it's like. Yeah. Well, Eastern is a, a relatively newer program. Um, I say relatively, it's, it's been growing. You know, we got the new building a few years ago or a couple of years ago. So we've been really working on growing it. Um, and they've, I think the, the performance requirements right now for people involved in private lessons it, are pretty strict, strict. It's, you have to do two public performances and one of them has to be solo. Wow. So, um, I've got a good group of students now and they are generally excited to perform as often as possible. Um, That's awesome. They, they do like, uh, we call it uh, noon colloquium hour, Fridays at noon. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, I think maybe two or three of those per month are student recitals. And then the ones that aren't would be like a guest lecture or maybe a student presentation of their senior thesis or something like that. But there are a lot of performance opportunities and they are required to do uh, at least two per semester, which is great. It's um, that's, that's killer. Good for you. To, it's to good that they have the opportunity to do that, that much. Yeah. Yeah. So let's move forward a little bit. You're at heart. Uh, you're getting your, your ass handed to you as most incoming guitarists do. Um, Dick is yelling at you. Oscar's yelling at you. Everybody's yelling at you. You're crying in the bathroom. You're skipping meals. Sounds uh, all about right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there was one one story. I'm not going to share it now, but one story where where Dick goes, "You're going to be crawling out of here by the time I'm done with you." And I was like, "Yeah, right." And I left, and I burst into tears. Oh my god, it was that was a rough night. That so was like I, probably the worst. I played um, for my graduate recital. I played the third uh, third lute suite. Mm -hmm. the a minor lute suite yeah the one that was i believe the fifth cello suite if i remember that right um and bach transcribed it himself yeah. so i play that and it's got the super slow sarabande that has almost no notes 
Yeah. And it's just like, bah, da, 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 bah, right? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I went into my lesson for that where I was supposed to play the Sarabon and I hadn't memorized it and I read it in the lesson. This is, this is how, this is approaching your a recital? This was, I think in the, it's sometime during graduate school. Okay. Um, I don't remember, I don't remember when. I think it was early though. And I went in and I read it and I had a lesson, a whole lesson. And at the very end of the lesson, Dick, was, Dick said something like, by the way, if you ever come in here with one page of music not memorized, just don't come in or something like that. <laughs> and I left like pale white shaking, yeah. like, oh no, I disappointed him. I want to be here so bad and I disappoint. And like, I, that was the only time I think I ever, you know, upset him and, or I'm sure I did plenty of times after that, but that was the only time where he really let me know that I yeah. had not met the requirements. Yeah in no uncertain terms. <laughs> um, so you finish your pro, you told me, uh, I remember I, I was like, I think I'm gonna go to Hart for grad school and it was you and, and somebody else. Um, and you said, yeah, good luck. It's a really hard program. And it is, it, it was a very hard program. Um, I wish I could do it again, you know, just in a, in a vacuum without job, family, life <laughs> to get in the way. But, but I wish I could, I could go and do it, do it a second time. That's kind of how I feel right now with, quarantine yeah i'm just shedding i yeah. have no gigs i have no work i have no other than teaching a couple uh, you know a handful of hours i'm just uh practicing so so you left heart and you tried to do the classical guitar thing for a long time or for a, for a period of time and then you sort of found a, a, another set of skills that you were good at and pursued those what was it like leaving heart so uh, let's see, I finished Hart and I was teaching at the community division. I started teaching at the community division uh, right when I started my master's. And I also started at uh, Miss Porter's in Farmington. Because when I started my master's, Chris actually had moved back down to Virginia. Uh, and so I took over some of his teaching, which at the community division and at Miss Porter's. So right away, I was already teaching, I don't know, at least 15 to 15 to 20 students a week, even during portions of the masters. So I was right away, I was teaching a lot. And I, I had so much information from my two years there. And I needed, I think it took probably at least another three or four years before I could actually get a lot of it into my fingers. Mm. And really, I, I made a bunch of mistakes um, in terms of practicing or not practicing. Just I didn't do everything exactly how I should have at that point. But eventually, a lot of it kicked in. So I did a ton of practicing and a ton of teaching and not a whole lot of performing during the years immediately after my master's for maybe... Um, maybe about three or four years mm -hmm. i would play i would play some background music gigs i'd play some wedding gigs um but i don't think i started doing a bunch of recitals until three or four years after after my masters and I, i'm trying to remember i don't remember the exact time that i was uh started playing in the quartet with chris right and nick and jeremy but it was it was several it was a bunch of years after grad school probably not close probably not till about 2010 or so what uh what would you say to yourself looking back at that time where you said that you weren't doing things the way that you should have been what would you have said to yourself what was are some of the specifics um well i resisted when if it's i mean there are things that i i, I could do better if, throughout my personal life and throughout all that stuff. But we're mm -hmm. talking about guitar specifically. I resisted the whole uh, singing thing <laughs> very much and singing letter names specifically. And this is something that isn't unique to heart, but uh, it's definitely not ubiquitous for people in the, to sing. In the, guitar, in the guitar community. Right. So I think singing letter names and memorizing letter names 
uh, I resisted that to my own detriment for way too long. And I, and I, I don't think I ever really did get it the way that I was meant to, or it, it was hoped that I would. Right. So that's one of the things that I know I really wish that I, if I were doing that time over after school, I would take it more seriously and I would have stuck with it, but it's, it, it's hard. It was really hard. It's hard when you come to it as a young adult and, and, and in some ways you're like, this goes against everything I think I'm supposed to be doing. And it sounds dramatic, but that's, that's sort of how it feels. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, well, it's just, I think there is a degree of humility that you need to sit and sing. Like I have some music out here. If I were to sing one measure of note names for a brand new piece, I think now I'd probably be fine. But back then yeah. I wanted to play. I wanted to shred. I wanted to play. I'm looking at Villa Lobos Etudes. I right. wanted to play them and I wanted to play them fast and I wanted to play them you know, as well as everybody else. I didn't want to sit and just repeat one measure over and over singing the note names until I could do it without looking. But apparently I didn't understand that that was actually how I would have gotten to those goals or that exactly. was a big step towards those goals. So yeah, I, you know, I have been given good instruction and I followed it really well, but I didn't follow through on it as much as I wish I had in the, you know, I don't know how you describe 2007 to 2012, so the, still the early 2000s. That would have been in my life a hot mess. I was still living <laughs> at home. <laughs> uh, um, I, I could probably say the same for me. <laughs> so at, at what point did you go from doing the classical guitar thing to now starting to play pit shows and then I, in, in my understanding of you and your trajectory, there was a point where the classical guitar stuff started to take a back seat to the the um, to the stuff that eventually led you to to all these these shows that you're doing now. So I played in the New England Guitar Quartet. I think we were together for about three years, maybe a little, little somewhere three to four years, yeah. and loved playing in that group. It was, you guys need to you need to write a book about that experience someday because <laughs> I've heard bits and pieces of the saga. Yeah, it that's was, for another that's for another conversation. That's for another conversation. The the, the full nitty gritty, but there was a lot of coffee involved for sure. Of course. But, um, but I loved playing that in that group in that, and I loved playing the music that we played. I love I loved playing with those guys, um, and I feel like at that point that was the most invested in classical guitar music that I had ever been. So when that group fizzled out, I was kind of down about playing classical guitar because that was, right. that was supposed to be what I, I wanted that to be my thing was playing in chamber music, but with my friends who were guitar players. And I thought it, and I, I have no regrets about it fizzling out. You know, that's just the way things go. But at that time, I was kind of down on playing classical guitar. I couldn't find any solo music that really excited me or that would keep my attention for very long. Um, and at the same time, I had always wanted to learn how to get better at electric guitar and jazz, uh, jazz specifically. And I'm I'm still not very good at jazz, but it's you know. pronounced uh, jazz. <laughs> it's a soft, soft J. Jazz like, flute, like yogging. Yeah, <laughs> um, little anchorman quote. Um, so you drink the blood from the skull. Is that what he says? You know, you know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, I, I I know that movie too well. Anyway, so I I decided to you know start getting a little more serious about some electric guitar things that I wanted to do. And I just for I just wanted to play something for fun, and I started playing with a couple bands that didn't really do much, but one of the bands worked quite a bit, and I, I made a little bit of money doing that. But I was able to you know develop some reading my reading chops a little bit for that one of those bands, and uh, I. Dumbled, I don't remember exactly. The first show I played was at a high school in Suffield, Suffield Academy. 
Mm -hmm. And it was with Nick, actually, we played the wedding singer. And that was just because a friend of a friend, or actually, no, Chris recommended both of us. And so we played that gig. A friend of a friend, indeed. Uh, (laughs) We played that, that show. And then I got recommended for another one, not maybe like the next year. And it seemed like over the course of two or three years, enough, a lot of people just, you know, I I would do as good of a job as I could at these shows. And I was able to get recommended for other ones or called back the next year for ones that I had done before. And um, it got to the, and then I'm trying to remember some of the timing things, but it just picked up gradually, Mm -hmm. but almost exponentially. So each year I would, one year I did two shows, the next year I did maybe three or four, and then the next year was like five or six. And then the next summer I played 16 weeks in a row. Right. uh, Until, you know, the past three years, I've basically played five nights a week for, I don't know, maybe 45 weeks out of the year for the past three years. Just gradually picked up. What is that life like? um for the for the the layman um of of not well i I was just going to say the difference between the classical guitar concertizing gigging world versus the the pit life well i think because it's hard to sum it up really i think for me because playing in a pit is more similar to playing in the uh when i was doing chamber music or playing with the quartet because you're playing with the group so the stress of being absolutely perfect all by yourself on a stage as a soloist doesn't really exist or uh, i'd never experienced it so it's more of a it's more of a group effort right i would say that the musicianship and the musicians that i've worked with uh are extreme it's at an extremely high level um so in that regard there's it's not any different in terms of the demands of what is expected of you it's just the aesthetic is different the you know you don't have to there's not a whole lot of virtuosity playing in theater well, Every you now don't and... see it. You don't see it in the same way that you would see if someone was playing the Chacon. Right. It's, I, it's not I, as I re- exposed, but it's, it's... I remember one of my, when I subbed for Nick doing hair, um, you'll know this guy. I'm sure you play with him all the time. His, his Sizzle, what's his name? Seth. Seth. Yeah. And um, there was, we were doing hair and I, some, some, I don't remember, maybe it was Emmett doing, was the MD. And they said something like, oh, no, no, we're doing this in A. And he goes, oh, okay. And then he just, boom, like just could transpose it. For a trumpet player, right? Like whatever. But for, for a, a lowly guitar player, like that's a skill that we don't think that we need until you see someone do something like that. Yeah. But that's why I say the virtuosity is, is more hidden, right? Because think about the skill required to do something like that. He's probably been doing that kind of stuff for years in order to make a decision. That was like the night of a show. Because he was subbing too, I believe. Yeah, and uh, it's, I've had to do it some t- a handful of times. It's not something that happens as often as you might think, uh, at least not in my experience so far. And I've only had to sight read shows like, of all the shows I've done, I think I've done, I don't know, maybe 50 different productions, but I've only had to sight read shows maybe three or four times mm-hmm. where I actually don't see the music until I get there. And so that it's it's scary when it happens but it's it doesn't happen all that often but yeah the the virtuosity is different it's not maybe it's not as um explicit it's kind of like the virtuosity and how how tight can you be rhythmically with the other players how how kind of in the pocket with the drummer can you be or how well can you phrase with the reeds who are sitting like 30 feet away from you on the other side of the pit and you can only hear them through headphones, but you still have to phrase with them and line your part up because every now and then the guitar doubles a melody. You know, it's, it's just, it's chamber music. 
yeah yeah well you know um one of the things that i noticed about the the very limited experience i have with pit gigs is that as a and i i, I suppose i could say this for the my rock band experience too as a classical guitarist i'm looking inward when i'm performing I'm paying attention to myself. I'm paying attention to the music. I'm paying attention to my, my body, whatever it is as a, as a pit musician or a band, uh, if you're playing in a rock band, you have to then also have a version of yourself sort of out in the audience. How do I sound? What's my balance? Like, am I, am I improvising too much? Should I maybe change this voicing? Is this, is this overpowering you uh, in my experience, you have to have, you have to look outward, not just inward. Yeah, uh, that seems to make that seems to be accurate. <laughs> I don't know. I had I played three or four shows. I did uh, the clowns with Andy Mayo. Uh, where they they are doing a like a a playthrough of that. Like a, a what was it called? An open open read type thing. They were they were workshopping it. Okay. Um, and that was a lot of fun. And then I did Alter Boys. I did the whole run of Alter Boys, which is so much fun and those guys those the actors were were awesome um and i did i subbed for hair and then i think i did something else hair was that was an interesting gig was that a playhouse that was a playhouse and it wasn't just the butts that was interesting the thing that was interesting was i love that there's like a guitar solo moment where they're like just make noise and like you can't for once everyone's like yeah that's really cool where in my experience as a guitarist i was always apologizing (laughs) And that's why I don't do it. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I like I, I'm trying to think of your statement about playing inward or or being more outwards. See how I relate to that. I guess, like in a in a practical experience, if I'm playing Bach, and I not at heart where there's where there's people that are in charge of my grade there and uh, and ego. But if I'm out playing in the world and I and I play Bach and I decide to do something or I or I make a huge mistake, the consequences are going to be on my shoulders as I leave. But I I haven't really damaged anything, any anybody else's experience. Hopefully, if I'm doing something and I play a wrong note in in a pit or a rock band or I do something I and I really do something out of character if I'm playing too loud if I'm showboating if I'm doing something that's inappropriate I've now put all of those people who right. are on stage sharing that weight with me in a very uncomfortable position and I suppose you could say the same thing about chamber music but in my experience with my flute player and I we had such a um uh a good understanding of each other and of the music where I think we were prepared for, for any sort of like, Oh, I'm going to try to do this or try to do that. I think we revered, we respected the music a little too much to, to make those kinds of um, decisions. I don't know. Maybe I'm just, no, no, I, I, no, I get what you're saying better now. I think in pits, we have the music director who is sort of, uh, you know, is the conductor and the, the music director makes, We'll tell you if you're playing too loud or if you're if the improvised lick you just played was out of style or inappropriate for what they're trying what they're trying to do and they're the conductor so the the way i approach playing a a show is it's not about what i think about the show or it's not about what i feel these notes should be it's about serving the show and serving the music and the final word lays with the MD. So I ask for feedback a lot. And I ask, you know, when they want to give me room to do what I do, then I do what I do. And they'll, you know, if they don't like it, they'll tell me. So it's kind of, but because like what you just said with chamber music, you respect the music so much that you don't want to uh, do anything to take away from what it's supposed to do. I, I treat pit playing the same way. I, if I get an open solo in like Greece, if I'm playing Greece and there's a guitar solo, I'm not going to do like a Van Halen thing, like you know, Back to the Future when he starts tapping. Why not? Tapping. Why not? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's why it's a good gig for me, and it's probably some other people might get in that situation be like, oh, I'm going to shred. I get a solo. This is where I get to me. do what I you do. You could say it. You could. It's me. <laughs> okay, it's you, Ben. 
But for me, I'm going to play a Chuck Berry lick or something, and it's going to fit. And the goal is going to be to make it sound like it belonged there. And in that regard, nobody should really even notice it. It's it's just part of the backdrop of what's on the stage. And that's where I'm most comfortable, kind of being a part of a bigger thing, just and playing my role, except my role is either under the stage or behind the stage, dressed in all black so nobody can see me. I like that. Um, so nobody would notice that it's there. I mean, that, that makes, you know, that's, that puts them in perspective. And you're also talking about being a part of a bigger picture, which is probably why the, the quartet felt like such a home to you. Yeah, um, for sure. But hearing you talk about all of these different things that you, you have to be able to draw uh, on it from a moment's notice, um, how do you how do you approach this idea of a well-rounded guitarist who is because you're not just sitting there practicing uh, pit music all day? I mean, I see your stuff on Instagram. You're like shredding Marvin licks, and and uh, picking up you know playing the black to camera on and doing all this stuff. How what, what's your approach like? schedule wise to trying to become a well-rounded musician, and I, I suppose philosophically too. Well, I, I think part of why theater is a good thing for me is because I do truly and honestly really do enjoy just about every kind of music. I, I love to play and I love to play lots of different things. So it's easy for me to just follow different areas and just kind of follow my muse to see, all right, today, like maybe the first two weeks of quarantine, I was transcribing a lot of uh, George Benson and and then do working a little bit out of the uh, Charlie Parker Omni book, just because I w- wanted to get back into some some bebop stuff. Uh, and then I started working on the Marvin tune, or I started working on. I was actually somebody sent me uh, music. Do you know the uh, Goat Rodeo Sessions, which was Chris Thiele and, and Yo Yo Ma, no, and Edgar Meyer. Check it out; it's really good. But somebody sent me. Uh, the score and parts for one of the tunes off that record. And I was like, all right, well, I can work on my mandolin reading chops. So I think for a week I worked on that and it's, it's so hard that I can't even come close to playing it, but I was just, it was a kind of fun thing to work on. So for me, diving into all the different styles that I may need in theater is, is the fun of playing. That's kind of why Mm. I play. Yeah. So that so that I can explore all those different things. Um, today I was doing more transcribing of uh, modern jazz guitars. You know, you um, this wasn't released yet, but I did an interview with a friend of mine, Brett, who's down in Nashville, and he um, he's a keyboard player, and he came from this very serious jazz classical stuff up here and then went down there and realized i have to be able to play anything at any time if i want to pay my bills and it sounds like you you i think you both have a respective love for the the genres of music that you're playing but it's it's kind of kind of honorable that when somebody needs you you're the one who's there who loves it and can do it because I think there's no shortage of stories of guitarists showing up to important gigs um, and, uh, you know, face planting. Yeah, that's, you know, that's the fear. <laughs> I, I can, I've taken lots of gigs where somebody says, hey, do you play this? And I say yes, and then I go learn how to play it. Right. Um, it's just, I think that's kind of part of the theater world or part of even just part of commercial commercial music Mm. is that if if you don't know how to do something and this is actually something that i think goes back to classical guitar if i don't know how to do something i know how to learn how to do it and i that's kind of through my training at heart and all the way i've practiced classical guitar over the years has led it to be so all right like i played that marvin head that i posted last week and that's i don't usually play things that fast but i know how to get something to be that fast and i know the process i have to go through to do it i have a good idea of how long it'll take me just based on you know the metronome marking so and it's just it's kind of 
I can confidently say yes to something, even if I can't already do it, because I know that I'll be able to learn how to do it. It's really incredible what those two years can do to you just because of the caliber of education. And um, I don't want to get into it, but you know, there's, there's plenty of killer players or not so killer players that went to places and you think, Oh, well, that's impressive on paper, but what did you really learn from that? Have you, have you really changed? Are you really a better person when you came out of that? But what I want to ask you now, I know we're, we're getting a little close to both of our respective bedtimes, <laughs> although Dark Souls 3 is staring at me from across the room. Um, I don't even know what that is. So, they're, 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 the series is heralded as like the hardest game series ever. Is that created. video games? I, I don't know video games. Yeah. Oh, no, no. It's all, it's, I lock myself in my closet, Dark Souls, and just, <laughs> and just laugh at what I did to my head. I don't, <laughs> I don't know, man. Yeah. I, um, was, I think I was tragically bad at video games when I was a kid, so I just don't play them. That's, that's probably better for, for you. Um, how did you get into the Broadway scene? Because uh, a couple years ago, I think when I, when, actually, when I came to pick up that guitar from you, I believe, um, the, uh, the classical guitar that I sold to one of my students, um, you had said, oh, I'm starting to crack the Broadway scene. So I actually, I haven't fully cracked it yet. It's, it's, a, it's a tough thing to crack when you live two and a half hours away. Um, you, can, you have to be there to, to play there. Uh, I did have a, an opportunity last winter, or early, last kind of March and April, I played for two months uh, of an off-Broadway show. Um, so I stayed down in New York for the better part of two months and played that show. Well, what show was that? Uh, it was a musical parody of The Big Bang Theory. So okay. that that's a that's a genre right now. The or it's been a genre, but it's a genre of parodies of TV shows. So the uh, there's a parody of The Office that I think was still running before everything shut down down there, but that had been running for several years, and we were in the same the same building in the theater upstairs from them. Please tell me there's one for Everybody Loves Raymond. I don't know, but I mean, I'll pitch that to somebody and see. <laughs> see, see. So pitch it I have to Netflix. They they greenlight it. I haven't fully broken in down there. I've got. I've made. I've been able to make a lot of friends who do play on Broadway, who either sub or have their own chair down there. And you know, the way to do it is that you try to get. I think you try to get on somebody's sub list, and that's generally the way uh, it works. Um, when I would talk to the guitar player from Jersey Boys down there, he basically said, you've got to be, you've got to be here. He's like, if you want to be on a sub list, you have to be here and you have to be available. Otherwise, you're not incredibly useful as a sub <laughs> if you're what, too far away. What's the, what's, the cali what's the difference in caliber of musicianship from someone who's on top of their game here to someone who is starting to sub down in, in the Broadway scene? So the musicians that I've worked with in Connecticut uh, in, in at, like the good speed people, the people who play at Ivoryton, and then uh, the people I've played with a bunch of other places are, in, are top level. They're, they're New York City caliber. They just don't live there. But the guitar players in New York City are terrifying. <laughs> they're, I, I've been down, I've done some recording things. Uh, do you, have you ever seen the apartment sessions? Yeah, yeah. On YouTube. So I've been down for a bunch of those. And anytime I'm in a room with those people, at least half of them have Broadway chairs or have toured supporting major, major pop artists or jazz artists. And it's like being that, you know, starting at the conservatory on the first day again, where you're just the tiniest fish surrounded by these players who are so good. And that's what it feels like every time I go down there. And I don't feel like it takes away anything from what I can do, but man, they're good. They're yeah. in order to thrive down there. You've got to be good. You've, you've got to have lots of things going and uh, everybody that I've met can just can really, really play. And it's, it's so much fun. I'm, I, I consider myself pretty lucky to have gotten to play with a lot of those people and to meet a lot of them and, it's inspiring. I'll say that for sure. Where do you think those people um, 
get their education? Is it, do you think a similar path where you get a certain skill set and then have to develop that on your own? Or is this situations where these players have been playing their entire lives? What have you seen? I'm not really sure. A lot of, I, a lot of people I've met have gone to Berkeley because I think the, the, the apartment sessions group is, a lot of those people went to Berkeley. So there's a big Ber Berkeley ne network down there. Um, but, you know, a lot of them, I think it's the combination of getting good instruction throughout their lives and, and then following through on it yeah. thoroughly. Like what I didn't do those couple of years after grad school, but you, I, they all seem to, it seems effortless when you watch them play. So, you know, they've all spent their time in the shed and they've all done all the hard work that you do when you're in college or when you're an undergrad, when you're in your master's. Um, and then they all just sit there and effortlessly make really, really great music. It's, it's, uh, I don't know how they do it. If I did, I would, I would do it too. Before we go, uh, can you give us a little, little gear rundown? What, what are you using, um, in your, what are you, what are you playing nowadays for? So for I've, um, I've acquired a bunch of guitars because they, it seems important to have the right guitar for the right, for the gig. Um, so I, I still have, I have one classical guitar. I have my Chapman, um, which I love. And I've played Chapman guitars for a while now. Um, I have a Strat, a Tele 335, um, all, none of them Fender, none of them Gibson all mm -hmm. different brands, but you know, in the, that style, uh, I've got a tenor banjo and a five string banjo and a ukulele and a mandolin and a lap steel. Uh, I currently have a resonator and a dobro sitting around. Um, so I've got lots of different guitars to cover the, the, the theater gigs. And I, I'm just, I'm kind of in a fortunate position to be able to have all these, which, right. which is nice. But when I play a show, I use the uh, Line 6 Helix, which is Line 6 all self-contained modeling unit, which you, you, I'm sure you know, but it's it, you can plug for up to four instruments in it. I get all my amp sounds, all my effects. I can plug my a microphone into it. I can plug my steel string into it. So I use that basically as the, the center of my pit rig. And you keep it set on the insane mode, right? Yeah, all the time. Like line <laughs> six spider, insane amp. When I worked at music and arts, um, there would, in a lot of the, the, uh, the lesson studios, they would have two amps. It would be like a Fender, like hot rod junior or whatever it is like the, yep. the, the blues the, junior probably. Yeah. Something like that. And then the line six, and I would be like, can we just get anything else? Like you can give me a crate 20 watt one channel amp. Um, but the, the you, cause you and Nick both play the same line six and it sounds, it sounds good. Thanks. Yeah. It's, I, I like it a lot because of the options. I'm getting better at it, at dialing it in. Um, there are lots of people who get great sounds out of it. So I try to learn from them. I know a lot of people on Broadway are using them now. A lot of people on Broadway use Fractal too, the mm -hmm. XFX stuff, and those all sound great. I think any of those units, once you know how to use them well enough and really learn how to dial it in, you can get such good sounds. I do have a, a couple small amps that if I'm playing an actual gig on a stage with a band, I'll take an amp just because it's, I like to use an amp and it's fun to have that sound. But for the majority of what I do, I use the Helix and I either use, I have a small QSC monitor or I have headphones or in-ears that I'll use depending on what they have, have you, at the theater. Have you ever, ever seen someone roll up with like a Marshall stack? And like I'm here for... I've never seen it in Greece. person, but I have seen it on Facebook. <laughs> I have seen, I have seen pictures of people using like, like a 212, like a small head in a 212 in a pit. That's and me. That was me. I did that for Alter Boys, but then also Alter Boys, the band was a part of it because Alter Boys was these guys with a rock band was part yeah. of the, the, yeah. the shtick. So I had my, my 212 there. Um, last question for you. What would you say for someone who is, is um, 
getting into music, maybe maybe something a little bizarre like the the guitar, and wants to make their living out of money that comes from either playing or teaching that instrument? Um, I would say one really practical thing is to, as a guitar player, work on your reading. Uh, make sure you can read, and I don't. It doesn't matter what what you're reading. Just pick up a book of music and read from it for as many minutes a day as you can. I used to do an hour a day of reading. Um, so just that's with the numbers underneath, right? With the tab. <laughs> no, I would try to go with no tab, but I wouldn't actually learn how to play any of the stuff. I would just read it. I would just practice working out the chords, practice working mm-hmm. out the voicings. I'm better at reading four voice counterpoint than I am a single melody. Cause I learned how to read on classical guitar. Uh, but I would say the reading stuff and then, whether you're studying classical guitar or just teaching yourself some electric guitar or whatever, or jazz guitar, I think do what you're really do what you're doing wholeheartedly, but keep your ear open to other things, you know, really do that one thing. I really did classical guitar. And I think I got the benefit of that more so if I had just kind of dabbled in it. Yeah. So really dive in but make sure you're keeping your ears open for uh, other things because that's where if you want to just play classical guitar go go for it and and do it and it's hard but if that's what you need to do it's going to be really rewarding but if you want to make sure that you're available to do other things you know keep an open ear absolutely uh before we go is there anything that you want to plug uh i know the shows are are on hold right now, but is there anything that you want to promote? I have a terrible Instagram page because I'm awful at social media, but it's Dan Hardington guitar. If you want to see my uh, handful of licks that I learned and uh, that's about it. I'm I'm trying to be more active on that, but I really, really am bad at it. So uh, I hear me too. (laughs) Nothing. (laughs) This, this interview is my, uh, my big the contribution thing that, I, that I'll be yeah. plugging soon, soon, unless you decide that it's so bad that it's not oh. getting released. Oh, I was supposed to press the record button. Oh, we'll have to, we'll have to do it. <laughs> we'll have to do, no, I'm good. I'm busy. I'm yeah. busy. I gotta, I gotta go to work tomorrow. Yeah. Nothing, nothing major to plug, but feel free to check out my, my Instagram. I'll make sure to put that at the bottom. Dan, thank you very much for Thanks, uh, a lot of fun. Thank you.